production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High. Explore the rich and recent history of Valentine's Day cards. Satisfy your sweet tooth with a visit to Mellow Confections. And we'll visit the fictional town of Charlottesville where everyone is loved. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. And will you be my Valentine? The tradition of giving your sweetheart a written love note on February 14th dates back way before Hallmark. In fact, the oldest Valentine on record is a poem written in the 1400s. But the mass-produced, factory-made cards that we're all familiar with today have a much more recent past. They've only been around since the 19th century, when they started to replace all those handmade and handwritten love notes. I recently met with local collector George Johnson in Lancaster to talk about how this tradition has evolved through the ages. All right, George, so you're a bit of a Valentine historian in a way, right? Yes. So tell me about your collection. How did you get started with this? I started collecting in the 1970s, and I, I really admired the artwork and the, you know, how, how lovely they were. I started collecting what collectors today call fold-down valentines that, that pull down and open up oh, cool. into beautiful scenes. Mm -hmm. You weren't just going to the drugstore and buying valentines. No, how were no. you finding these? I was buying them at antique shows mm -hmm. and antique shops, and places like that, you know, flea markets. A lot of times Valentines have been saved for many, many years. I have several in the collection that are all 200 years old wow. and still in good shape. Do you have any concept of how many you've collected I and mean, how your collection has grown over the years? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but there's probably two, three hundred um, wow. Valentines on display here. So much love. <laughs> it's kind of great. That's right. This particular one is the earliest one that we have uh, in the collection. So this one is essentially, you know, 200 years old. Wow. On the back, then, is the handwritten poem. That's handwritten. Poem. Our penmanship skills have gone yes. down. <laughs> I like this, many waters cannot quench love. This one, it dates from the 1840s. and. Um, it has perforated lace on it, it has satin in the center, and it's a very lovely card, but the most interesting part, at least to me, is that each of these wreaths, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and each of these will lift to reveal a little, little message, message mm -hmm. behind it. That's so cute! Everyone, except Sunday, because Sunday, Sunday. is for church, and church we're not going to do any right. of that. <laughs> Hanky panky type stuff. <laughs> and these little envelopes. And then each one of the six days of the week, they're listed here. Wow. Has a little tiny envelope. That doesn't open. And it opens. Oh, stop. And inside is another small message. handwritten message. Um, this one is from the 1870s, probably. <sighs> and uh, it's. It's gilded, perforated lace paper. It's very unusual in the sense that the back is just as decorated oh my gosh, as the front. It is. With a, um, uh, that's a spun glass um, medallion what? in it. That's amazing. And then this is the hidden picture. Okay. You want to take that other side? We'll open it up. To see There's the, the little couple. On the inside. Running away together. So this is a, what they call the trick valentine. So we've got a little silk cord with a little piece of uh, silvered um, cardboard on it. And when you pull the string, it lifts up into a three-dimensional form 
with a little love note at That's the top. That's beautiful. How elaborate. You let oh go of gosh. it and it lays flat. So it'll go through the mail like that. Right. And then, you know, simply pulling the string. And what lifts era is it up. this from? This again is probably 1870s, maybe wow. 1880s. So intricate. The majority of the display here runs from 1820 to um, 1930s, 40s. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a few that, you know, younger kids will recognize too. Expressions of Love, the Valentine Collection of George Johnson, is on display at the Decorative Arts Center in Lancaster through February 28th. Visit them online at decartsohio.org to learn more. As we just saw, some folks send cards for Valentine's Day, some send flowers, and some send candy. We met up with Michelle Allen at her new shop in the Arena District to check out her tasty confections that are sweet to receive any time of year. We are in my new cafe, my confectionery cafe, Mellow Boutique Confections. M-M-E-L-O, which funnily enough came out of a sound that my husband would hear because I, I started kind of doing this in Spain and my husband, people would try my food and people would go, hmm, and it just kind of grew out of that sound. So yeah, that's where mellow comes from. You know, marshmallows have really fallen from grace. They were a confection for kings. And the reason for that is you can do so many things with the flavor and the texture and the, the, you know, you raise it a few degrees and you get like this, a Swedish marshmallow, which is a bit rubbery and that's how they like it. Or, you know, you add a bit of egg white to it and it's like a, it's almost like a foam. The French call that a gouy mauve. So that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of pushing the, the virtues of marshmallows. I grew up just off of Livingston Avenue and the southeast side and went to Ohio State and was just chomping at the bit to get out of town. I traveled all over the world and a lot of that travel actually ended up informing the recipes I design now. In September of, of 2015, I quickly came back to, to the United States, incorporated Mellow contacted a, a, a contact that I had over at Easton Ownership. They gave me this creme de la creme spot on the strand. I had Louis Vuitton across the street and you know Apple on one side or, or Michael Kors on the other. It was mad. That would never in a million years happen in Europe. I was there for eight weeks. Based on the strength of that, I got corporate clients. I got, um, I found the funding for my business. I would never have gotten this far in Spain, ever. Part of, the, um, part of the research that I've done in, in, in food is really trying to make sure that, that I and my team really understand why you make the ingredient choice that you make and how that basically interacts with the human body. That in addition to the, the commitment to using, designing all the recipes around, you know, real food, whole food ingredients, not using uber refined flours, not using uber refined sugars, not using artificial flavors or sweeteners or, you know, all the sort of stuff that we now know we shouldn't really consume. You know, people ask me all the time, can you do a, a sugar-free treat? And my response to that is, I would love to, but there isn't a natural way to do that. You know, we can do low glycemic, but we can't do sugar-free. I'm not trying to say that Mellow is, is health food, but it is food. It is not junk. It is not made with junky ingredients. There's, there's thought behind the way that it was built and constructed. 
And a lot of people here in Columbus have done some amazing work in terms of creating the, the food landscape here in, in Columbus. It's, it's, it's so impressive and I'm so proud of my hometown. And I really hope that Mello can contribute to that in a, in a, in a, in a really positive way. From gourmet marshmallows to handmade tea cakes, you can find all manner of sweet treats at the Mellow storefront in the Arena District. And check them out on Instagram. This next story is about finding love and acceptance. When Charlotte McGraw was a teenager, she was in desperate need of love and guidance. Instead, she was institutionalized. But now, through her art, she has created the kind of place she craved as a child, one where everyone is welcome and no one is turned away. She calls it Charlottesville. Cody used to always try to get me in the art room. And I told Cody, I said, look, I don't do art. He said, Charlotte, you don't know unless you come in and try. And I told him, nope, I don't do art. So he kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. So I said, oh God, let me go in here and keep him quiet. Well, Charlottesville is a little town where my creatures can come. And um, they're not looked at like they have a disease. They're looked at like they're human. And everyone in Charlottesville is loved. No one gets turned away. No one gets made fun of. We in Charlottesville love each other. And I happen to be the mayor. When she first started working with this, and we had that backdrop, it was one of the first creatures she did, it just sang. It was, it, just, it was just wonderful, it had so much character and it really conveyed a lot of who Charlotte is as a person and, and um, her idea of what, what life should look like. My creatures sometimes go through the same things I've been through. So I understand how they feel. They come to Charlottesville they're, they're, they're given a job and they're an integral part of the community. They're accepted, they're seen, they're loved. Generally, I do collaging, um, painting, um, some drawing. I mean, a lot of her images have, there's a certain sweetness about them, but some of them are a little bit, a little intimidating. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Cause they look at my art. And they're like, where does your mind go? You know, and I said, I have my own little world, you know. And they say, what makes you do creatures? I said, because I love it. I said, uh, they're my own people. I was in an institution, and I went there when I was 16 years old and I didn't get out till I was about 27, 28 years old. And it's for people that have uh, physical and mental disabilities. But uh, it was a rough go. Um, you just never know what you're gonna see when you go into these places. Um, and a lot of people don't need to be there. Um, I think what it is, people get put in these places because no one wants to take the time. It's not necessarily that there's something wrong with them. It's just that they need someone to guide them. And when I went in there at 16, I was just a hot-headed teenager. And um, I didn't want to listen to anyone. Um, but I was labeled. I had problems at home, so I really didn't have anyone that I could go talk to. Um, missing a lot of love from home. Um, 
It makes you do things that you normally wouldn't do because you don't have that stabilization at home. I worked my way out. Um, I showed them that I could succeed in society and that I was not uh, incapable of taking care of myself. Right now, I'm doing a seri series, and it's called Popo. And I don't know if a lot of people know what Popo is, but it's the police. <laughs> I do creatures uh, that are coming to jail. It's called Charlotte's Correctional Fitness Center. Once they leave my jail, they have lost a lot of weight. And they go tell their friends, if you want to lose weight, you know, go to Charlotte's Fitness Center. You'll lose some weight going there. So it's basically, you come to my jail, I'm going to work you. And you're not going to get a lot to eat. <laughs> If it wasn't for and Debbie and Kate or Cody, this wouldn't be happening. So I appreciate all of them. Everybody that's in here, and like I said before, the family. You know, we all look out for each other. So it makes it worthwhile. You can see more of Charlotte's work at the Goodwill Art Studio and Gallery on Edge Hill Road in Grandview. Check out their Facebook page for details. Let's get back to Candy, because it's the source of inspiration for our next artist. At first glance, his work might leave you longing for candy necklaces or a bag of sweet tarts, but a closer look will reveal a slightly darker side to his colorful illustrations. When I sit down at a blank canvas or a blank piece of paper and the process that goes through my head is I want to take whatever happened that day, good or bad, and translate it into my world. And therefore I feel like I have a control in such a chaotic world. Someone described it and I love the term. They said uh, he creates sugar rush art. I'm inspired by cartoons and actual candy, the colors in candy and the whimsy and kind of childlike feel that goes along with all that. But there's also a slight darkness to it within the colors, the bright colors. So like candy's delicious and good, there's still a, it's not really good for you technically. I get a lot of mixed reactions with my work. I'll have kids that just totally get it. And they'll come up and I'm thinking they're just attracted to the colors, which may have brought them to it at first. But they get the monsters, they love the monsters. It's funny with adults, some adults do get it, but there's some adults that refuse to see the darkness. They'll see the light colors and they'll see it's adorable. And I almost have to point out, look, there's, it's not all sweet. That confuses them at first. They'll buy a piece and sometimes they'll message me later and say, I did not see that there was this darkness happening or this monster that's right in that background. It's just a matter of what they experience first. You have these talents, why not draw whatever you want to? I'm not really worried about what are people are gonna think about it. There's always just the personal thing that's going on with me that I'm just getting it out, almost like, it's almost like therapy, sort of. However, people will see it and they will translate messages to it and how they apply it to their lives and what they're going through. And I don't think it's wrong interpretations. I think all those interpretations are right. That's almost where the art becomes something new to me. As far as my inspiration with the dark side of things and the lighter side of things is I feel life is just full of that. There's so much beauty and ugly happening at the same exact time. So I put that into my work. When I first started this whole art thing, I never thought it can actually get to where I'm at now. I've had opportunities I never thought would be possible. I've had it in museums, I've been published in magazines like The New Yorker, and I don't have a specific goal. Just see where it goes. I kind of like the organic branching of it. I just kind of like seeing where it takes me. Sort of a destiny thing, I guess.
The couple in our final story today enjoyed a lifetime of collecting glass art. That is until they retired and decided they wanted to start making it. I would hope that someone coming into the studio for the first time to look in choosing to take something home for their own would be finding some of the joy that we find in making the glass. Neither of us have had any art background before we got involved with building the glass blowing studio. I'm Dick Moyel. I was in the medical field as a neurosurgeon. And I'm Kathy Peppel. For the last 25 years, I've been married to Dick Moyel, and for the last 20 years, we've had a glass blowing studio together. Before we took on this venture, I was a physician assistant, and before that, an operating room nurse. So Dick and I were accustomed to spending a lot of time together and working together. The roles may have changed a little bit once we got into the glass blowing studio, but there was still a dynamic that seemed to transfer pretty well to this setting. Could you get the door for me? And then I'm going to go past you to cool the pipe before I go to the bench. Okay. okay. The process of glass blowing is really seductive and addictive, apparently. So we just wanted to try it and didn't have the time to do that before retirement so after retirement we started taking classes don't you think we tended to be the oldest students I in think the class? We're, the, we're the oldest <laughs> as they refer to us as ma'am and sir uh, but we've learned a lot there wasn't art class community in Houston, we made attempts to check the various uh, colleges and universities, and there wasn't a program, so we decided uh, to build our own studio. Beginning glass blowers all have the same style. It's the glass being itself. Over time, with an understanding of how the material works, and how it handles, then you can start to ask it to do some things we're interested in having it do, but it's really a relationship that continues to go on with the material. There are some basic steps for all blown objects, getting enough glass on the end of the blow pipe to accomplish the piece usually takes up the most amount of time because that's where the coloring and the patterning occurs. Okay. We start out with a shape idea, but if the feedback we're getting from the piece runs counter to that, then we make adjustments during the process. So once all of the pattern and the glass is on the end of the blowpipe, the glass is blown out, the walls are thinned, the shape is refined, and then the glass is transferred from the blowpipe to another steel rod so that the raw end that's broken off the blowpipe can be shaped and formed. And when that's done, the glass is put into an annealing oven where it is cooled at a very prescribed rate, depending on the thickness of the glass, to relieve the stress in the glass to bring it down to room temperature. The challenge has been to know what our limitations. We have smaller sized equipment, so we're not going to be able to do gigantic pieces. How does it feel? Feels good. I'll go right to the glory hole then as soon as you break it off. I think the biggest I'll difference the is that there's, there's room for play and experimentation here, whereas in the operating room there was none of that and there door. was a stress that's hard to kind of define, but we, that's something that we, are, we don't feel at all here. Blow again. When we're in the operating room, the patient's asleep. Stop. Stop. Nice. And everything that's movement is movement with the, the hands. But here, the, the glass is moving, and we're getting up and reheating and you know, cooling, and so it's, it's that aspect. We're not stable in one position for hours. Glass blowing is a team effort. Okay, got it. Torch? Because it's safer to do with someone helping, but it's also a community project and process then. It. And that's part of the joy of working with glass and blowing glass. And to be able to uh, partner with my partner is really something that's pretty special. I don't, we wouldn't give that up for anything. <gasps> yeah. 
<laughs> Teamwork. That's our show. You can see all of today's stories at WOSU.org. And of course, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing the show with a ballad by local pop band Truslo. The track is called Lover, and it can be found on their 2014 album, Hurricane. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you back here next week on Broad and High. You, you and I, in the spell of the night. The butterflies, they dream Just to feel what we've seen To be lost in the beauty of love Carla Risch Chaffin, scenic design artist. I love making a whole new place out of blank canvas. I collaborate with the director and the designers of light, sound, and costumes. Research and clear communication are my best tools. It takes me days to paint a backdrop. It's hard and joyful work. I've trained horses, I've drawn flowers in church, I've been in an alternative rock band. The path of an artist is not linear, and Columbus understands that. I can earn a living here, and I get to explore in a place where the works of other artists inspire me too. I'm Carla Risch Chaffin. Scenic design is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.